Friends, welcome to In the Movement, our webinar and podcast. It's great to see you all here. My name is Sam Heath, and I'm with Equal Justice USA, and we're a national group that's working to end the death penalty and to help communities think about what does it look like to respond to harm without centering police, prosecution, prisons, and punishment. And specifically, I'm with the Evangelical Network, and so my role is to reach out to Christians across the country to help churches and denominations think about those things and respond to the justice needs in their area. And so In the Movement is our monthly webinar and podcast series where we have people in the justice movement on where we want and hope to engage and elevate them and their work. So we think a certain way about mass incarceration here too. We think about that not just as an issue and not just as the problem, but as the symptom of something else. We think that within this country, we have an obsession and a reliance on punishment and that that's our knee-jerk reaction to things such as when harm happens. And we want to redirect that. We want to divorce this idea that punishment and justice are the same thing and have people think of and lean into when harm happens, how can we have a posture of healing and of restoration and mercy? And I keep thinking each time we do these webinars about the scripture that's most repeated over and over in the Bible or the command that's most repeated, and it's not to fear. I think so much of our criminal legal system underneath it is based on and focused on fear. And that's something that, especially for Christians, but for all people that we want and need a freedom from. And so today we're going to be talking about the death penalty in the United States. And I'm thrilled and pleased to have my friend and colleague here, Laura Porter, who's the executive director of the Eighth Amendment Project. So Laura, thank you so much for coming to chat and share your experience and expertise with us. Thanks so much for having me. So, so glad. So we'll have some time at the end, those of you who are watching to answer any questions that you all might have, feel free as we're talking, you can put those in the chat or in the Q&A, or you can wait until the end and we'll have 10 or 15 minutes or so at the end for any questions that you want to ask Laura. But let me set the stage for some things and then we'll jump right into the conversation. So again, we're going to talk about the death penalty today. And so start by thinking about our criminal legal system as a whole. And a couple numbers help us see the scope and the scale of it. There's about 2 million, a little less than, individuals who are in jails and prisons across our country right now. We also don't want to forget about the additional 3.7 million who are on probation or parole. So this is a, a massive system that we're talking about in the millions. If we're looking at specifically the death penalty since the beginning of this country, we've executed about 16,000 people. Right now, there's about 2,400 people on death row, and Laura can check me on this in a second, but I believe we just had our 192nd exoneration in Arizona. I want to make sure that we talk about that. The most recent execution that we had was last Thursday. It was a man by the name of Dwayne Owen who was in Florida. And the next two that are coming up are both on July 20th, Jermaine Cannon in Oklahoma and Jimmy Barber, who is in Alabama. And two other statistics that are going to probably guide our discussion, because these help give a sense of the death penalty piece of the criminal legal system. About 80% of executions are in what people often call the Bible Belt, which is noteworthy, but even more noteworthy when you think about that. That's the same number of statistics that we think about when we look at the history of lynching within our country. And the last thing is keep in mind that about 41% of those that are on death row are people who are Black, when our national population for people who are Black is only 13%. So all of those show some nuances to things happening within the death penalty movement. But Laura, where I'd love to begin, because we gave some of the things that are weighty and sad, is how do we see momentum in the death penalty movement for change? Or do we see that within our country? But well, we definitely are seeing change. Um, and even in the last five, you know, five to seven years. So, for instance, in um, 2018, the state of Washington ended the death penalty. In 2019, the state of New Hampshire ended the death penalty. In 2020, the state of Colorado ended the death penalty. In 2021, the state of Virginia ended the death penalty. So, there's a, a cluster right there of states, you know, moving forward. We now have um, 27 states with the death penalty. So we're almost getting to the halfway mark of, of, of half of the states ending the death penalty. Um, we other have we have other signs too of movement away from the death penalty is 
the majority of states that have the death penalty are barely using it at all. New mm. death sentence, new death sentences are at an all time low. Um, they remain low, and executions have also been reduced over the last you know two decades. Um, and so you know there's a lot of states that I would deter, I, we call them ambivalent, like they have it on the books, but they don't use it very much. And that is a place to kind of get ready, you know, get get a place to like end. Um, uh, start talking about ending it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing I would take into consideration is the understanding that I do think in today's world, we are in a, a, a current era of the return of tough on crime rhetoric in the political space, right? Mm -hmm. that, that there seems to be that like talking about crime and politicizing it and with the baby between parties or between individuals or whatever seems to be on the rise right now. But I would say that the death penalty is receiving the least harm of that new ever mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i and i think it's because um there is an understanding that the death penalty does not accomplish that much but i also think is the understanding is that we have a very diverse coalition of people who are coming to this issue and saying this isn't worth it anymore and it's not working and particularly increases from people who come from a pro life perspective people who come from a redemption perspective people who come from a perspective that they don't trust government to mm -hmm. fix a pothole so we don't trust government to take a life and um and with this diverse group of folks who are now coming together and saying this isn't working they're less um they're less impacted by the fear mongering that goes mm -hmm. up and down in politics they're really kind of looking at what works and and i think one example of that is with what we're seeing in the response to gun violence and mass shootings and there will be an ever long debate in our country about what to do about guns. But what we're seeing is about where people do not agree on that, we're starting to see a lot more convergence and saying like, well, we should address mental health issues. You know, we should address, have more services and treatment for, for severely mentally ill people or have it more available. And that's like left and right coming together. You know, and mm -hmm. so there's examples of kind of saying like the response to and prevention of these type of crimes needs a new approach. Mm -hmm. And that's new. That wasn't the case even just a few years ago. I feel that change in the national dialogue. Yeah. And I think it's because there is a broader understanding of what's not working, mm -hmm. you know, and so mm -hmm. looking for new things and looking for, for, for solutions. And, you mm -hmm. know, so this year, for instance, during this tough on crime rhetoric, um, being lifted up, there was a couple of states were toying around with the idea of bringing back the death penalty who don't have it. Um, Iowa and West Virginia, both controlled by Republicans. And um, they, um, uh, there was very little interest from their, from mm -hmm. their colleagues in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a really great sign to show like, we know we don't want to go backwards. Yeah. So it sounds like in a lot of states, once it's gone, it's it likely is gone and it's much harder to drum up the support for it to have for it to re-enter. So far. I don't I don't want to do so far. It so yeah. far. It's so good. Yeah. Right. That no one who's gotten rid of it has brought it back. Right. So you also talked about Virginia, which is where I live. And so that stuck out in my mind. But I also know that Virginia was the first Southern state and the first former state of the Confederacy to repeal the death penalty. And so that was and the most recent right now. And so that's that's all very significant. And again, hopefully this this linchpin moment for all these things. Yes. And, you know, Virginia historically was the highest executing yeah. state in the modern era. Texas is the highest executing state. But Virginia, historically, if you had all the executions from, you know, historically up to the modern age um, has been the highest executing state. And it was a very, very um, uh intense and uh, a state that was attached to the death penalty. So the fact that a state could move on from that is just is just tremendous. Yeah, yeah. Well, talk about what you mean by the modern era of the death penalty and why that that moment is an important kind of BCAD marker in the movement. Yeah, well, there was a period of time where the death penalty was held to be unconstitutional in the early 70s. Um, because of the arbitrary nature that it, it like the, the arbitrariness in terms of how the death penalty was applied. But the Supreme Court left a loophole and said, if there's a way to do this more fairly and head up a system that 
makes sense and that it doesn't feel like it's just arbitrarily decided who gets it, then um, the death penalty is okay. And so all the states uh, started crafting together statutes that the Supreme Court found acceptable in terms of determining what were mitigating circumstances, what were aggravating circumstances, and the modern day death penalty statutes um, came about. And so it's basically from the early 70s or mid 70s to now is what we've been calling like the modern era, kind of like the second go around mm -hmm. of, of executions. And and that's where we're counting the exonerations. And it was a man in Arizona, right, that just last week was the 192nd exoneration. Yeah. And there's just, you know, there are there are, you know, there are others as well that may not be, you know, included mm -hmm. as well. It's a very hard term to define, um, but it's basically if a court has found that the that the evidence used to convict somebody was insufficient um, and they were wrongfully convicted, that's how the word exoneration has been used mm -hmm. historically, okay. um, and um, the the numbers keep growing. Yeah, so at least 190, and and these are just the ones that we know about, and and from information and investigations and what we know, we know there are innocent people that are on death row right now. Yes, and um, you know that that has been shown again and again. It's just that you know to uncover and expose a wrongful conviction has just incredible amount of forces against you in terms of getting mm -hmm. the court to agree to take a second look. Most the law does not require a second look. The law does not, you are only, um, uh, the constitution requires you to have a fair trial. It does not require you to have an accurate trial <laughs> a result, yeah. right? You said that 23 states have repealed plus DC. I think it is 13 states that haven't had an execution in more than a decade, five mm -hmm. states. And does that include Tennessee that have a, a moratorium on executions right now? Yep. And, but I also don't want people to forget that it's not just states that we're talking about. There's the federal death penalty, and then there's the military, too. There's all three of those spheres within our country that have it. What, under the Trump administration, what were the numbers of the federal death penalty, and, and how and why did that stand out so much? Well, I think that, you know, it shows, and, and this can be in any state, and, and this can be applied to any party, but it shows the political nature of the death penalty, because in the federal government, they hadn't executed anyone in decades. And then um, with a new executive who decided this is going to be a goal of ours to get this forward, they executed, you know, so many people. And so it shows that just it, it can be at the whim of, you know, where, where no one is executed and then lots of people are executed. And that has been playing out in the states as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is uh, it is it, it makes it in it, it, the Supreme Court originally struck it down because it was arbitrary and mm -hmm. it feels arbitrary today as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then about 70 percent of other nations in the world have abolished it, too. So we're not just talking about momentum within our nation. We're also looking at this on a on a global stage. And you talked a little bit about the public support, too, has has drastically changed. I mean, the 1990s and the death penalty movement was a totally different world so far as public support. Right. That's right. And, you know, I think a really fun example of that now is that there is a um, there's an ongoing and moving and exciting campaign in Ohio, a state that Republicans have a super majority in both houses and a mm -hmm. Republican governor. And there's a very exciting movement right now to possibly pass repeal in the next couple of years to end the death penalty. And a poll done there recently um, by a Republican pollster that is well, well respected in the state found that a majority of people support ending the death penalty in the state of Ohio, including a plurality of Republicans. And so it's very exciting. And, and yeah. a thing that kind of links together what you were saying at the beginning is in that same poll, they found that 60% of the people of Ohio support redirecting resources that are used for the death penalty, which you know are exorbitant, to evidence-based community programs that would reduce violence and help those harmed. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was not a a, a red or a blue issue. That was an mm -hmm. everyone issue. And, and the, mm -hmm. the pollster at the time said, I can't get 60% of Ohio to agree that the sky <laughs> is blue, but I can, it's fascinating <laughs> that 60% of the people wow. pulled support, you know, using resources on this kind of ineffective response to violence and redirecting it to more effective responses to violence. Wow. All that in Ohio, it's even more poignant 
considering that Brian Stevenson of Equal Justice Initiative gave his gave the speech for the commencement address at Ohio State University, yep, someone nationally and internationally known for his work against the death penalty, is there and speaking and experience so much support in that act. Mm -hmm. Now, one other thing, if we're talking about places and spaces where the death penalty is, one thing that, that I didn't know until a bit after I came into the movement was, yes, it's helpful to talk about states when we talk about the death penalty, but it's also a matter of counties, and it's also a matter of judges. And if we look at it in terms of certain counties, certain attorney generals, certain judges, it really starts to narrow that we're not even talking whole states that are doing this, but that it's very targeted areas that are issuing death sentences within the country. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing that most people don't recognize is that really it's the prosecutors. Like it's the number one determination of how often a death sentence is sought is, is in the prosecutor's office. And so even in a state like Texas, which has the reputation of being, you know, liking the death penalty the most, happily executing people, there is a minority of counties in the in the state of Texas that ever even seek the death penalty at all. Mm -hmm. A huge, huge, huge majority of prosecutors in Texas never seek the death penalty. And so it's really fascinating. So it's basically 2% of the county prosecutors in the United States are mm -hmm. responsible for all the death sentences. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad you're here this month because last month, EJUSA's executive director, Jami Hodge came on and she's a former prosecutor and she was able to speak and underscore so much of what you were just saying of the power and weight and influence of a prosecutor and that the system being very prosecutor centric. And so to hear you say the vast majority of prosecutors in a state like Texas that we think Texas, we think death penalty aren't even seeking it is so significant to show the movement on this issue. Yeah, it, it, it really is astounding, but it also, again, leads to like can you do this fairly? You know, can mm. you have a system that take has the power of taking life fairly? And you know, my conclusion is no, <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Well, let's let's flesh that out some. You talked about that the death penalty isn't working. And so so let's go through some of those typical arguments that people bring and, and talk about, well, how does this not actually do what what people want? So so one, maybe the easiest one to start with is is the death penalty fiscally responsible? I mean, I I, uh, in my exposure to the uh, many evangelical events and, and, and uh, communities have always heard the term that a budget is a moral document, you know, mm. and that, um, and so I think that, you know, to, to use the amount of resources for like, and putting, you know, where sometimes we get it wrong. Um, sometimes it's biased and unfair in terms of who is chosen to get a death sentence. And on top of all that, we're putting victims' family members through mm. decades of uncertainty um, and causing harm through the very process of a, seeking a death sentence. And so when you put all those together and then realize we're also spending a real lot of money on this minuscule number of cases when there's all these other concerns, both in the legal system and in the broader society, it just doesn't make any sense. And that there's ways of accountability to have without um, uh, imposing a death sentence. There's ways to keep communities safe without mm -hmm. having a death mm -hmm. sentence. And so, um, yeah, I don't think so. And, and I think to me, like, what I would want everyone to understand about the death penalty is that we can't do it well. Mm -hmm. We can't do it well. And so it's an unanswerable conundrum that if you were trying to be as fair as possible and look at as, was the process done fairly and have no bias and to make sure that you're not executing somebody innocent, one is I think you can't ever guarantee that. But even if you're going to try, it takes decades of scrutiny to look at those cases to see were they done fairly, was there bias, was there a mistake made, and mm -hmm. then that long process causes additional harms to victims' family members. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you were to shorten the process, you're going to be risk more executing innocent people. You're going to, um, you know, you're going to risk more that we're not going to we're going to ignore bias or unfairness that happened. Um, and if you lengthen the process, you're caught. So it's an unanswerable conundrum where nobody, nobody wins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you touched on so many pieces of this. I mean, I, in a sense, I started with the fiscally responsible one because it seems like that's the thing that 
that now least appeals to individuals, but yet it's also something that's that's really quantifiable. I mean, when you change a case within the court system to be a capital case, it, it drastically, it changes everything of those who are brought in, of how it's looked at, and then of the cost of that escalates dramatically for that to be able to go through the court system. So that's that's just a practical piece, and that's true of, of any county and any system. All right, well, how about this? Does the death penalty, can it be done and you, you answered some of this, safely and in a non-torturous manner. Keeping in mind that last year was was called, what was it, the, the year of the botched execution? Um, I can't answer that like in terms of like scientifically, right. but I can, I can share that, you know, that we've messed up a lot, right? In an effort to kind of, we try to sanitize the execution process for the viewers. Um, but that does not sanitize what's actually happening. And so mm -hmm. lethal injection was originally intended to be a um, kind of a, a more humane way of killing people. But the process is how it's played out has been the exact opposite of that and has led to suffocation and trauma and, and during the execution process. And one of the reasons of that is, is that there was um, a lot of masking of what is going on. There are drugs given in the lethal injection process that paralyzes the person who's being executed. So if they are in excruciating pain or they are in suffering um, from suffocation or burning or things like that, you will see nothing. And that's mm -hmm. purely for the viewers. There's no medical reason to add the drug that mm -hmm. paralyzes except to make it look like it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and we had a lot of experimentation around gas as you know, on the electric chair and and um, there's been some problems with um, with firing squads. But I, I think that um, killing a, a healthy person is a gruesome act. And so it's hard to to avoid it completely. Yeah, uh, I, I do believe, you know, there's arguments that there may be some ways are less less painful or less gruesome than others. But the act of killing is is a gruesome act. Mm -hmm. And you said this, the whole process is shrouded in secrecy mm -hmm. from who's allowed in the room to who's allowed to be in there. Things are not recorded. You can barely write anything down. It is it, it done often in these rural excluded places. Uh, it's done with drugs that sometimes we don't know the origins of. Like it is, a, it is a very tightly held process, which is a change, right? I mean, uh, up through the 1920s, we were having very public executions out in the town square that that was something that people could come to. This was an event. And then there was a shift and that things were brought inside and underground and, and continue that way on uh, intentionally. Yeah, and I think that's a really... Um poignant point you're making because I think that that's where America is is like they, we kind of like the idea of the death penalty mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. we don't like getting very close to it you know and and I think one um underlying fact that so many people who are not forced to come into contact with the death penalty don't um, have a chance to learn or think about is the impact on corrections mm -hmm. is that it is incredibly traumatizing and has proven to be over and over again on the team that is asked to perform the execution. Yeah. I'm in the state of New York, which has not had death penalty for a long time, but the last three state executioners in um, New York committed suicide. Wow. Um, and, and it is very, very traumatic so you're it's like again like you're the act of killing you're impacting so many people yeah. beyond just the person being killed and that the whole process is harmful to so many people beyond mm -hmm. just the person who is being killed i think about the letter in oklahoma that was written by many within the department of corrections to the attorney the new newly incoming attorney general back in i think it was january saying essentially that of because at that point oklahoma was executing one individual a month and they were saying we cannot sustain this this is not something that, that that we can psychologically sustain or even for practical purposes be able to sustain and we forget that we forget that that cost that it has that collateral damage on others other than just that individual often yeah, one thing too that I think is also just really poignant is that if you ever see the um, the the protocols within a state, they determine about what you need to do before an execution. Often it starts like forty five days ahead of the execution or thirty days ahead of the execution. It is a book like this fat, like minute by minute, like 
and it's an attempt to, again, like kind of sanitize the process. Like if you just have a bunch of things you're supposed to check off, you know, like this and we're supposed to move them to this cell. We're supposed, it, weirdly, you're supposed to be constantly check on the person you're killing's health to make mm-hmm. sure that they are, mm-hmm. they're healthy and mentally fit, even though you're about to kill them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's like the number of things that you're supposed to do, it's very it's very chilling to read yeah. the protocols um, and and the fact that, you know, people put together these books that are like this fat to like yeah. how do, we're going to kill someone. And it, it really is to make it more, it's to remove ourselves a little bit more from it. Mm-hmm. It's like we have all of these processes in place, but the bottom line is, is we're still killing somebody. Mm-hmm. We mentioned Brian Stevenson earlier, and so I'm thinking about his, and I'm 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 not going to say it rightly, but his his phrase of saying that it's much easier if you are, essentially, it's much easier if you are rich and guilty of a crime than if you are poor and innocent to go through our system, and, and often that would apply to the death penalty as well. So, is the death penalty done in an equitable way if we're thinking about things like either race and or socioeconomic status? Right. Well, we talked about like the charging decisions of, of right. a prosecutor who often is elected as a, you know, in a political election, you know, and right. so that politics will play into what they think or perceive the need to show that they're tough on crime or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, those who are um, who have less power in society are easier to react more strongly to a crime. Right. Um, and to other, you know, and to make uh, uh, an example of. But I also think that, like, right, the the process itself in terms of how much does the state allocate for defense services, Mm -hmm. how well trained are the people giving the defense, do they have access to investigators, do they have, and Mm -hmm. it really varies, like, crazily, like, Mm -hmm. um, from state to state or from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And so some, they won't have access to experts or they won't have, you know, they'll have so few resources. A a lawyer representing someone charged with a a capital crime could potentially get $2,000. We're talking like to be like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and so it's just kind of like it is is very, very varied. And so and there is no um, universal kind of there's bar standards that are recommended, but there's no kind of implementation to make sure that the um, the defense and the services that people get who are charged with crimes are are equitable. Mm -hmm. So we know the death penalty has a high degree of inequity within it. We know that if we're looking at it from a fiscal standpoint, that it's an exorbitant amount of money. We know that it is often done in a secretive and in a torturous manner. What about its effect on crime? Do we know whether the death penalty has an effect on deterring crime or not? Because that's another argument that I feel comes up very often of, we have to have this so we have a show of force so we deter future crime. Right. And and I think that like, this is the hardest question and one that is an important question to ask. Um, and I think that... W- to those of us who want to end the death penalty need to give a very credible answer to that mm. question. And the credible answer is there is no proof that it has any impact. Mm. Do you know, so it's like, if we're not saying that by having the death penalty or not having the death penalty, that crime is impacted. And they have done study after study of like, they've done, um, the National Academy of Science did a mega study of all the deterrent studies out there. Some say, oh, it it, it, it does serve as a deterrent. Some say it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And the answer after analyzing, they found fault in almost every single study, like the, their approach to the study and what they mm-hmm. looked at. And basically the answer is, there's no evidence that it provides any deterrence at all. And I think that like one of the things that I learned in, in doing this work is that when you talk to law enforcement, for the most part, that law enforcement, many law enforcement do support the death penalty. Many don't, but many do. But they're not saying it's a deterrent. They may think that it's an appropriate punishment. Mm. Um, but they would argue that it's, you know, resources in a community, that it's resources for police, that it's training, all of those things impact violent mm-hmm. crime, as opposed to having a punishment on the books that may or may not happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've pinpointed some the places where my deepest conversations go, because sometimes when it begins, well, well, one, often when I talk with someone about the death penalty, and I wonder if you experience this too, people often end the conversation by saying, 
wow, that is the longest conversation I've ever had about the death penalty. So one, I think it's something that a lot of people just haven't considered a lot or, or in depth until they're kind of forced into that moment where they really start to think through it. But a lot of my conversations get really interesting and really deep when we go through sort of that laundry list of things. We know the death penalty is racist. We know that it's expensive. We know that it has no effect on deterring crime or, or doesn't at all, that it's done in this torturous manner, that it's secretive. So we can, in a way, logically throw out all of those arguments. And what we're left with is someone feeling that when harm happens, those scales of justice are imbalanced and they feel punishment brings back that balance. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately a philosophical or a moral or even a theological question. And it really puts someone, I, I think, graciously in a corner to say, if we really think that when harm happens, requiring some kind of pain or punishment in response to it. One, it's really important we admit that, and it's really important we dig into why do we think that? Because we know all these other things. The death penalty is not doing. It's not doing almost all of those other things. But if someone just wants someone to be punished, it does that. And so we have to ask, is that wise? Is that helpful? Is that just? And is that really what we want? And that's a that's a moment of reckoning for people. There's not a question there, just to say that you you highlight that piece of punishment of that that is, I think, the deepest and most difficult, but also the most important part of the discussion. Yeah, and, and I think that it brings us back to the point that I made earlier is that we can't do the death penalty well. And, you know, from years of work with victims who have suffered um, violence in their lives and have lost loved ones to homicide, what I have learned is that the notion that there is a worst of the worst is offensive, mm -hmm. as if there's like some murders that are bad and the other ones are ordinary murders, right? Like there is like, it's like loss is awful, violence is awful, harm is awful. But we think as a society that we can kind of pick the ones that deserve the death penalty. And the, and, the, and and as we know, because of bias, because of things like there, so basically there are more victims of color of violent crime in our country than not, yet very very few victims of color result in death cases, right? And so I, I think that um, that I don't trust human beings who are fallible to mm -hmm. make that determination. I don't believe that there is like, that, that, I mean, all violence is terrible. Losing someone to murder is, is, is just horrendous. And we want to help and treat and help heal those people, help prevent further harm going forward. And that as a, there is no system that can like pick and choose mm -hmm. in a way that is that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of homicides are are lead are death sentences. Yeah. So it's just a minuscule amount and they take an exorbitant amount of resources compared to other um, other cases. Right, and right. Other, and so it other Let's crime reduction activities, right, as well. Absolutely. I mean, if we go back to that deterrent of crime piece, I mean, the likelihood of a murder actually being brought all the way to an execution is incredibly small for mm -hmm. all the reasons that, that you just named. Right. Let's talk about the Eighth Amendment Project and what that is and what your work looks like with that organization as a whole. Well, we are just, um, you know, this the Eighth Amendment Project came together um, after many iterations in the movement of just saying, like, those of us who want to move the country further away from the death penalty should all be talking to each other, mm -hmm. you know, and learn from each other and share ideas and hopefully kind of come to um, some conclusions of like where we should be working, how we should be working and helping each other. And so the Eighth Amendment Project is a result of kind of years of that kind of thinking and coming together in terms of like, how can we stay connected to each other? How can we um, share with people who want to donate to the work, direct them to folks in programs that interest them the most, you know, on the, on the issue? Um, and how can we help make sure that people doing the work get the skills sets and needs met that they have um, by talking to each other and sharing ideas and learning from each other. So it's really kind of a facilitator of bringing mm. folks who are like-minded and saying, we want the country to move further away from the death penalty. What are the activities that we should be doing? And mm -hmm. as you know, there's like, um, you know, with, with the different jurisdictions you name, which is the 27 states that still have it, and the federal and the military death penalty, that's 29 jurisdictions that would each have their own strategy to move further away from the death penalty. Right, right. And that's, a, to your point, a lot of collaboration. Yeah. How did you get into this position? I know that there's 
uh, some law in your background. I know that there's EJUSA also within your background. So what what was the pathway to get you to where you are now within the movement? I mean, I honestly feel like I'm one of the luckiest people in the world to have the role that I have right now um, because I'm I get to kind of operate at the 30,000 foot level and time to see like what's going on and can do can we help people get what they need and and things like that but um I was a public defender first and saw the inequities of how the criminal legal system worked up close um and then I got into the advocacy piece and worked at New Yorkers against the death penalty until New York ended the death penalty and then I went on to a national group at EJUSA and what really excites me about the work on the death penalty is that this is an issue where we can bring together people of very, very I different ideological backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and that in this very, very polarized world that we are currently living in, it's always been somewhat polarized, but now is an extreme. It does feel hopeful to work on this issue because we work with, with you know, conservatives. We work with very progressive Black Lives Matter, we work with evangelicals, we work with Catholics, we work you know, with, with so many different perspectives and who all come to the issue from a very personal and different perspective, mm -hmm. but come to the common conclusion that the death penalty is broken and is not serving us. And mm. so it gives me hope because I am seeing that really, really play out. Like I, you know, this is the evangelical network presentation. I grew up Jewish. And I had the privilege of going to meet with the board of the National Association of Evangelicals and talking about the death penalty. And I felt so welcome. And so it was mm -hmm. just thrilling and exciting to have that dialogue, to share I share common, common beliefs around redemption and mm -hmm. the dignity of people. And, you know, it's just so it feels like if you allow yourself to step back from the polarization, that there is so much common ground if we choose to let that shine through. Yeah. Can you talk about some of that path to both conservatives concerned about the death penalty and the evangelical network at EJUSA? Because you were around and incredibly instrumental in those things coming along. And, and, and here we are with the evangelical network doing its work now. So what were some of the origins of those things? Well, one of it was, um, as I said, so I, I grew up Jewish and I would just pay attention, but I was so committed to like expanding the conversation about the death penalty, as was my organization, Equal Justice USA, that we would just brainstorm, like, what does that look like? How do we have conversations with, with constituencies that we have no contact with? And, and I remember seeing um, two television pieces, one with uh, Dr. Sizik from the NAE. He was uh, Richard Sizik, who was the head of the NAE at the time, and also with Dr. Land from the Southern Baptist um, Conference. And they were talking, they were being interviewed. I don't know if it was 60 Minutes or some type of program, that, and, and it was two separate pieces. And both of them talked about a lot of similar themes about redemption, mm. about um, uh, about historical um, acknowledgement of, of race, issues around race. Uh, and I was like, wow, like this, I, I knew nothing about like these constituencies, but there's this common ground. And I was like, wait, right. there's, there's a place to start. You know, like, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of them had um, maybe a policy position of like, okay, we accept the death penalty, but concerns about how the death penalty was implemented that were so similar and the belief in redemption and the belief in the dignity of people and all that. So I was like, there is a place to have a conversation. And so it was really fun to kind of like think through like, well, what does that look like? We need to bring in people from that constituency who share our concerns to then start reaching out to others. And that's mm -hmm. what you know, that's what preceded your arrival wow. at um, at EJUSA is that work had gone on for about 10 years. Yeah, so. yeah. It's so encouraging that the beginning of it was seeing this overlap of values with other people and other groups and saying that's something that we can come together on and that's something to drill further into. I mean, I, I think about two other things with that. One, also the numbers. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't say it often enough, but there's 100 million evangelicals within the country of self-identified evangelicals. So it's a huge group as well if we're talking about the evangelical piece. And I think I told you this before, when I met Sister Helen a couple of years ago, she of course knows EJUSA, but didn't know me. And so I introduced myself and said, hey, I'm the new manager of the evangelical network. And she grabs my hand and says, Sam the evangelicals. They're the key to the whole thing. And it was the sobering, shocking 
funny moment of realizing there's such an element of truth in that. I might expand that just to Christians as a whole, because I think I've heard people like Shane Claiborne say, if every Christian woke up tomorrow and decided that the death penalty was wrong and they wanted to end it, it would be over in an instant. So not only is this something, it being the death penalty, that was largely created out of evangelical theology moving into the political sphere, it's maintained by that. So it's so important to engage that constituency and those individuals. Yeah, and, and another uh, memory I just had is back even before I was at Equal Justice USA and my first advocacy job, I was at New Yorkers Against the Death Penalty. And I saw a statement that Jay Sekulow put out that said that he um, had problems and opposed the death penalty. And I emailed <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, he didn't know me from a hole in the wall. And he responded. He responded immediately and said, yes, I am against the death penalty. These are the reasons why, as you know, when I joined EJUSA, he became a big supporter of the evangelical outreach of the conservatives concerned about the death penalty and was just kind of a big kind of voice willing to lend his anti-death penalty position in his name to like the the work to end the death penalty and mm -hmm. so it, it is a long long road yeah. but one that has made significant headway yeah i i love that story and I remember you telling it to me because and, and i think it's lodged in my mind because as you know i love and don't mind at all a cold call of anyone or a cold email of asking or introducing and it has led to incredible things of individuals now through social media it's even easier right to be able to to reach out people and try to get an audit at least in a small way and what that's shown me is a lot of people if pressed or asked at least have concerns about the death penalty especially within the christian world that doesn't really require you to do anything other than really remain silent on the issue but to put someone in a position of saying hey where are you on this or you said this maybe you think this too and it opens up so many doors for people. And it also helps connect people to your point of thinking about life as a holistic thing rather than just one piece or one aspect of it. But thinking about what does it look like for life to go from beginning all the way through its natural end, which would exclude the death penalty. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that it's interesting um, in Ohio right now, there is a number of um pro-life advocacy voices speaking out against ending, uh, supporting ending the death penalty. Um, I, you know, the, the head of the Ohio Right to Life was interviewed in the media saying that their board is going to consider um, taking a position of support of repeal. I don't know if that's going to happen, but they, they, they was interviewed in the media saying that they were considering it. And what I noticed about that is, again, is people coming from all different perspectives to this mm -hmm. issue. But that's how we kind of deal with the fear mongering, right? Mm. Like it's because crime is scary and sad and horrible. And that that so we obviously go to like a punishment or, or an easy fix quick. Um, but like if if there's some really deep thought in terms of like there's a there's an opposition coming from a very deep place, those folks cannot be fear mongered, you know, like it, it, and so it's just really interesting. Yeah. A couple other questions, and then we'll see if, if people who are listening have things they want to ask. Thinking about the faith world within the movement, what, what are some unique ways that you've seen people of faith get involved with the death penalty movement? And, and Or what ways could people of faith especially get involved within the movement? Well, in my years at Equal Justice USA, I was lucky enough to be you know, around through a lot of the successful repeal campaigns. And I can say without hesitation that if you were to say, who's our base? It's people of faith. Mm. That doesn't mean that not a lot of other people weigh in and have been right. incredibly helpful. But who's our like the people who um, who are there all the time and willing to engage and to be helpful are people of faith. Who those people of faith are? Are, as you have noted, has expanded over the mm -hmm. years and, in, and included different um, different faith backgrounds, different denominations, different you know different perspectives. But it's always been faith driven um, in in our movement. Um, and I can say also one thing that surprised me is that in the legislative campaigns, it you would think that a lot a lot of the faith groups who have historically spoken up against the death penalty, it would not be that meaningful to legislators because they're an obvious audience about mm -hmm. who, you know, but it does. And when mm -hmm. you have a religious leader press conference or if you have an evangelical leader press conference, 
it is so meaningful to the let the decision makers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because it gives them permission almost to be like their best selves or their higher self. You know what I mean? I I really do because I've been really surprised how much people of faith have been meaningful to individual legislators and they Mm -hmm. and they are. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and so what engagement has looked at has been as you know comfortable as you know contacting privately your legislator or signing a letter or petition or, you know, or writing a letter to the editor or those who have a, have a, you know, uh, who have a church, like signing an op-ed or, or something like that. Um, so there's all different ways of engagement. There's, there's talking about it on the pulpit. There's been mm-hmm. a lot of what well, we have uh, termed death penalty Sundays where people mm-hmm. have committed that we're going to have a conversation about the death penalty in church on a Sunday and, and share some perspectives. There's, there's church, um, you know, public education events outside of Sunday, just in the church structure. So there's so many different ways, yeah. but it, I, I can say that people of faith have been a huge force in ending the death penalty. Mm. Let me remind those who are watching, feel free to put in questions into the Q&A or into the chat, and we can start to go through some of those. So, Laura, one that came through was asking about faith communities, and are they more vocal in the pro-death penalty realm or the anti-death penalty realm? And I feel that maybe that's different than actual people getting involved within the work, but so far as being heard, where is that within the faith world now? And, And has that changed? over the past decade or two. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. So, but wait, oh, that's know. okay. Our, <laughs> our faith communities more vocal in the death penalty world against it or for it? Um, yes, I would say more against it, but are very mm. vocal um, and particularly new faith communities joining joining the effort you know so Mm -hmm. you know so for instance as you know the national association of evangelicals which is an umbrella organization of course but they have policy positions and they were at a pro-death penalty position and they changed their position to one of neutral because they thought it was worthwhile having this conversation and that there was really important conversation to have and that there were concerns right um you know and i can you know and i definitely think that um the catholic community which Mm -hmm. is has been long against the death penalty but they would deprioritize it opposed to other as a put in other issues has lifted up the um, importance of the death penalty in Mm -hmm. their work in catholic communities in a much higher level than they did 20 years ago when i first Mm -hmm. started getting into the advocacy space, you know, like the Catholic conferences or the Catholic leadership would kind of nominally say something and, and they were officially anti-death penalty, but they didn't put any weight into it. And right. now that has significantly changed. And if you actually look across the map of America, the states with the highest Catholic populations um, no longer have the death penalty, yeah. you know, it's kind of going yeah. down one by one. So it's just really interesting. And it's because they lifted up the issue more, more mm-hmm. than ever. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. So it's it, and you don't see a lot. And I think it's because a lot of there's there's always a few on on all sides of every issue. But I think whether um the faith communities that are not anti death penalty still, as I said, like care about a lot of the issues. Like there's so much common ground. They care about race. Um, and and its impact on the legal system. They care about redemption opportunities. They care, so it's just like so. There's so much already there to work with, even if they're not saying we're 100 percent behind mm-hmm. you know getting rid of it. And the other thing we try to distinguish in outreach to faith groups is that we don't, in order to support the work to end the death penalty, we don't think that people have to come to the theological con conclusion right. that the right. death penalty is not an appropriate punishment, but they may come to the conclusion based on the faith and the tenets of their faith that it's not working and that mm-hmm. it's not worth having. But that's a distinction that's important right. because there's some folks who will, will we could debate till the end of time about where they're theologically, it's right. acceptable, but that's not what we're saying. We're saying we don't need to convince you of that. We just want to show you how it's actually working. And that's where we find the common ground and mm-hmm. the willingness to let the death penalty go, that that human beings carrying it out, um, even if it's theologically acceptable, human beings carrying it out are too fallible mm-hmm. to do that. And the National Association of Evangelicals is such a great example of that neutral position that they adopted in 2015. But in that statement, they name, which is what you're saying, some of those issues of concern. Mm-hmm. They're not questioning whether that's something that's theologically that should or shouldn't be done, but they're noting the way that we're doing it 
isn't an act of loving our neighbor. And for that reason, we're at least going to be neutral. Some others would even go a step further and say, even though the death penalty might be theologically admissible, because it's not being done in this loving way, we will then, which is what I hope for the groups to move towards more, we will then call for a moratorium or just a, a complete Yeah, and, and as you know, we're already seeing that in a number of board members and leaders within the NAE who've gone that far and saying this is not, like, this cannot be done in a biblical way and that that this is not worth keeping anymore. Um, it's not representative of the whole, of the whole organization, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. there are numbers of people there. So I see it really, the conversation is changing and, you know, is trying to meet people where they're at and to mm. share them. And concern. And I feel that whether you're a person of faith or not, once you can kind of expose the fallibility of human beings and how the death penalty works, we get more people than we than we don't. Mm -hmm. Here's another question someone asked of where do you find the most needed area of growth in working with advocates and attorneys? So examples like bringing in politicians, victims or faith based folks. Where the um, that's a really good question. Um, we still need an incredible amount of work in the areas we're talking about today. Yeah, those are three great examples. Community and in the concert and conservative um, communities, because there's a lot, again, like I said, um, it, even if you're taking from a political conservative position in terms of like not trusting government to do things very well, wanting, you know, lower taxes and wanting more individual autonomy, the death penalty doesn't really match because it's such an excessive government power. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to, to kind of find more of the common ground of the people who um, maybe at first blush just not with us and think that there's they're not with us but finding that common ground so that's one um there has been a lot a lot of outreach um in the death penalty movement because we are forced to deal with the subject of violence to people who've been harmed by violence and that work can always expand but has gone very very well um and that more and more people who have been impacted by violence don't see the death penalty as offering them that much. Right. Um, but also we do, of course, respect people who do want it um, in terms of people who've been harmed or entitled to their position and we don't want to cause them additional harm. Um, but I think that um, that's that, that's a good question. But those, those two areas, mm -hmm. I think, are really key. And then just mm -hmm. get um, law enforcement to be, um, and particularly mm. corrections, I think that that's an avenue that we can be exploring a lot more mm -hmm. as the, the, the um, most states are, the correct departments of corrections are crumbling at the seams um, and really um, they're being overworked. They're being asked to do things that they don't have the resources or capacity. I'm saying independent of executions. So adding the stress of executions right. when they can't even yeah. get through the stress yeah. of their day is really, I think, an abhorrent ask of society of them. Um, and I think so lifting up the, the the impact on corrections and how corrections is already not getting what they need is, mm -hmm. is another potential avenue that we could go deeper into. Mm. If any of you are keeping up with the chat, it, you'll note that earlier, some of the discussion around Barry Jones, who was the individual who was innocent in Arizona, and whether or not he officially counts as a formal exoneree because of how is the language around this? Is this a way that prosecutors can save face that this is an official exoneration? And, and I highlight all of that just to say, it is wildly complex for someone to be an exoneree. And that, that is, to your point, Laura, I think you said earlier that what has to happen to get to that point is almost insurmountable. And so when that happens, it is a really, really rare. And again, Barry Jones is a good example of this and a very, very complex thing. Well, and Julius Jones is an example because mm -hmm. that many in the community who fought for his life believe that was a wrongful conviction, but he is now still sentenced to life without parole. Right. You know, so it's just the, the insurmountable amount of. And I think the other thing I just want to answer in that last question about what else are we want to try is that I believe in this world, and when there's this this incredible animosity and, and a misunderstanding of the words woke, of critical race theory, mm. of all of these things, that I believe there is a hunger and a desire to understand our history um, that, and, that, and that we can use history to kind of inform us of our decisions today. And mm -hmm. the history of slavery, racial terror, lynching, and the death penalty are so directly connected. And so how do you have that conversation? And one thing that excites me very much about the work is that 
Right now, there are conversations going on in conservative only spaces about this history of racial terror and the modern day death penalty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like they're closed door, private, comfortable conversations with people who are already from the conservative perspective who are starting right. to kind of question the death penalty. But we want to learn from them about how do we talk about the history of racial terror and the death penalty, because despite about what people say about CRT and being woke, and that's just like rhetoric out there that most people can't define. Mm -hmm. I do believe that, you know, there's been a lot of, um, as you know, and we're part of folks of different perspectives and backgrounds and ideological understandings, learning something by going to the Legacy Museum in, um, right. in in Alabama right. um, that Brian Stevenson started and, and put together mm -hmm. so beautifully. And so that, that I believe that this conversation can be had even in conservative circles. Absolutely. Around it. And so it is just it's important not to be afraid of it and not to and to and to have humility in your approach, but to not be afraid of it and not believe that because someone is a Republican or conservative or whatever that you can't talk about. Like, I think it's more important than ever to talk about our history and the connection to today and that people are open, not everybody, but then the right. people who aren't open to hearing about it. We may have trouble having conversations, but a lot of people are. And we are seeing that mm -hmm. in conservative audiences mm -hmm. who are willing mm -hmm. to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're saying that, remember, to a former history teacher. And so, yes, it's so important how that history informs it and how that plays a role in the conversation. And people could also look up later uh, the campaign from noose to needle and see and hear talks and discussions about how there is that connection of the history of racial terror lynchings to the death penalty today and how that was often explicit by governors of saying that they wanted to adopt death penalty within their state because they could not continue in lynchings because public support for that went down. And the, the, the connection is, is very clear and very much there and still plays a role in all of that today. So as we start to wrap up, Laura, a couple things. So if people want to jump in and get involved or just learn more about death penalty work and move in the movement as a whole, what's a good next step for people? Well, I really, you know, I, I, I'm transparent in my former relationship with Equal Justice USA, which is in my heart, but I would say to contact you and Equal Justice USA and have you plug them into local efforts. The death penalty is a local issue. You know, mm -hmm. it lives in the mm -hmm. states for the most part. Most of the people serving death sentences are, are convicted by state systems. And so it's really important right. to connect with the, your local, um, the local efforts going on there and to let decision makers, legislators and governors Prosec elected prosecutors and know your feelings about the death penalty. Yeah. I'll well then I'll throw this back at you and I'll put it there in the chat and we'll email any of these things that we mention in the next couple of minutes. I'll put in an email to anybody who's registered for this for this and you'll get those too. But on the Eighth Amendment Project's website on the contact page, not only can you contact the Eighth Amendment Project, but it lists out all of the state organizations that in each state that has the death penalty has to some degree some kind of coalition or group that's working to repeal it within that state and look and on that page there are all of those listed so if your state has the death penalty there is a group within the state that's working against it so i want to highlight that as well so and then i'll also say this i love that you said laura that the death penalty is a local issue and it very much is and so i'll, I'll say that our next in the movement webinar and I'll put this in the chat and again, email this to everybody. Next month on July 25th, we're going to go kind of from this national and state focus to a case study within here, Charlottesville, Virginia, in a group called Central Virginia Community Justice. And their restorative justice diversion program here within the city, thinking about what does it look like as a city for us to respond to harm with this posture of reconciliation, but in this very, very local way, in this small 50,000 person town, it's only 10 square miles and yet we're thinking about what does this look like but it underlines or underscores all these themes Laura that you've talked about of redemption and that so many people can come together around this and this group when they come and talk next month about it it's so interesting to see the wide table just like you've talked about in the death penalty movement but the number of people that can come together under thinking about restoration rather than just punishment it's it's a big table and when you pin people down often people will land on that as well and realize the death penalty just doesn't do that. So that discussion is going to continue, but also narrow next month. Laura, 
I so enjoy talking with you, both in this space and in our phone calls. And when we overlap, I'm excited to see you in person when we have some time that we'll have together in Texas. Thank you both for your work in this, the decades and all the ways that that's gone. Thank you for how you help bridge other people. Thank you for how you support the work that we do at the Evangelical Network. You are such a champion of all of that and have encouraged me these past couple of years. And again, the experience and expertise that you brought to people now people can see that. So thank you, friend, for all that you brought today and all that you bring to the movement so, so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and for all your work. And I see a number of partners on um, on the uh, chat who are participating and everybody, thank you so much for your work. Um, and for those who are new to the issue, uh, thank you for, for listening. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Anybody again who registered will send you an email with the recording of this. Uh, both for video and both as a podcast, all the resources that we mentioned. And if anybody's listening and wants to hear about it, please reach out to us. You're welcome to email me, samh at ejusa.org. But again, Laura, thank you so much for coming on In the Movement and blessings on all of you and the rest of your day. Bye-bye.